Hello and welcome to the first presentation having to do with our boat safety program. Uh, this first one is going to do with just sort of general maintenance and some general background information that will be useful throughout the whole uh, program. So let's get started. We're going to talk a little bit about the importance of maintenance, some uh, basic ideas concerning outboard motors, and a little bit about the maintenance of boats and trailers. All right. Well, why do we worry about maintenance? This is something that is very important to any kind of equipment, whether it's your own equipment or the school's equipment, your employer's equipment. The money and time spent in preventative maintenance is far uh, better than spending money on something after it breaks. And so we're always concerned about um, just staying on top of the maintenance. Uh, one good reason is that multiple users rely on this equipment. And so if you don't take care of the maintenance, then the next time somebody else uses the equipment, it might break down. And that's not really fair to them. Uh, the equipment is expensive, and so we need to take care of it. All right. Um, and also, if the equipment fails, that could be dangerous. For example, if a motor quits when you're in the middle of Kentucky Lake, that has the potential to be dangerous. Another good reason to stay on top of the maintenance. And finally, um, outboard motors and other small uh, motors are unique. Um, for example, they have very high horsepower to size ratios. They get a lot of horsepower out of a small size. But to do that, they have to be engineered very precisely. So they have lower tolerances. And consequently, maintenance is much more important. So if something goes a little bit wrong or if or if something is not taken care of well, it could have a, a big effect on these kind of motors. They're also used in harsh environments. Um, another interesting thing is that they're often run at full throttle. Think about the engine in your car. You don't run the engine in your car at full throttle. It varies quite a bit, but it's never wide open. But the outboards are either idling or they're wide open for the most part. Um, finally, they often sit unused for long periods. So for these and for other reasons, maintenance is a very important consideration. So let's talk about outboard motors a little bit. We have basically two types of outboard motor, a two-stroke motor and a four-stroke motor. All right. And anywhere you go, you're probably going to have a mix. Sometimes some of the motors are going to be four-stroke, some of the motors are going to be two-stroke. Um, and you need to know the difference between the two. So we're not going to talk about the internal differences and how the mechanics run, but we're going to talk about the practical differences. The first practical and the most important practical difference is where does the oil go, all right? A four-stroke is just like your car. Your car has a four-stroke engine in it. And if you look at the engine, there's a little spot where you pour the oil in. You've got a dipstick to check the oil, and that's the engine lubricates itself that way. But in a two-stroke, the oil is mixed in with the gas. And then when the gas is injected into the cylinder, it injects some oil, and that's how the cylinders get lubricated. All right? Um, and so that's just how they work differently on the inside. But the practical aspect is, where does the oil go? If you have a two-stroke motor, sometimes you have to mix the gas and the oil. So you've got your gas tank. You put fresh gas in it you have to take a certain amount of oil and dump that in with the gas, all right? Now, some types of two-strokes are called oil-injected, and that means that they have an oil reservoir uh, associated somewhere with the engine, and it's kind of like a four-stroke. It's just a thing where you pour the oil in, and then the motor does the actual mixing. You don't have to do the mixing. But it's a two-stroke in that the oil and the gas still get mixed together. It's critical that for every motor you work with, you know whether it's a two-stroke or a four-stroke, so you know where the oil goes. If you don't add oil to the gas of a two-stroke, and you're supposed to add oil, you can burn the motor up very quickly. All right. Now, some other practical differences between the two. Two strokes uh, tend to pollute worse. Uh, some of the newer ones seem to, to be less, to pollute less, but in general, two strokes pollute more. Two strokes tend to be noisier. Four stroke engines are often very quiet. 
Um, but two strokes often weigh less, so you can get more horsepower out of an equivalent weight. So let's talk about oil a little bit. Uh, when you're talking about an internal combustion motor, oil is essential. If you don't lubricate the inside of the engine, you'll burn it up very quickly. This is true for any engine. So it's critical that you pay attention to oil. This is something that we worry about every time we use the boat. Again, in a two-stroke, you either have to add the oil immediately when you put fresh gas in, or you add the oil to a, a reservoir or a tank, and the motor mixes it itself. Um, if you have to mix the gas with the oil, usually the ratio is 50 to 1. And usually you've got a nice little chart there um, so that you can figure out how much oil you have to add given, on how, given the amount of gas that you've just added to the tank. But you need to check. There are some outboard motors where the gas to oil ratio is 100 to 1. Um, but if you talk about some chainsaws, some chainsaws, their gas to oil ratio is 40 to 1. This is critical for you to know uh, before you use a two-stroke motor. Now, if you've got a four-stroke motor, it's just like your car, okay? Um, whereas the two-stroke uses a special oil that's formulated for two-stroke engines, the four-stroke will use basically the same oil as your car will use and you check the oil using a dipstick. But again, you need to check that oil level every time you use the motor. So those are just examples of types of two-stroke oil. You see it's two-stroke or two-cycle oil. And on the backs of these canisters, they'll have a little chart. So if you add five gallons of gas, here's how many ounces of oil you need to add to get 50 to 1 and, and things like that. Um, if you've got an oil injected, you'll have a reservoir that probably looks something like this. They all look a little bit different. And so this basically just needs to be filled with oil. And so you um, check it every time you use it. And if it's low on oil, you pour oil into there. And then the motor will mix the gas and oil itself. But again, this still uses that two-stroke oil. You don't put four-stroke oil into the oil reservoir for a two-stroke motor. Uh, if you've got a four-stroke, it's probably going to have a dipstick. looks something like this. You see this big yellow hoop there. Very similar to your car. All right, let's talk about uh, the gas that you need to use in your outboard motors. There's really no need to use the expensive high-octane fuel. The regular grade fuel is going to be fine. We always want to add a fuel stabilizer immediately upon purchase, so something like stable, okay? Fuel stabilizers, um, I can't say I know everything they do, but it has something to do with whether or not the fuel oxidizes. The reason we need to do this is because, again, outboard motors tend to sit for a long time. So you're going to have a tank of gas that's just going to be sitting there for long periods of time, and um, there are chemical reactions that can take place in that gas that are going to make the gas go, they call it going stale. And this ultimately, when that gas gets burned in your outboard, can cause deposits to form within the carburetor. And those deposits can start to clog up pores in the carburetor, and, uh, or if it's a fuel injector, it can clog up the fuel injection. Anyway, um, it's a good practice to always add a fuel stabilizer. Now here's the key. You've got to add it right away, okay? If you have some fuel that's already been sitting out for a while, um, then it's probably already oxygenized. Adding the stabilizer probably won't benefit you as much. So be prepared to add this right away. Um, avoid ethanol as much as possible. Ethanol is very hard um, on these kind of engines. Uh, the fuel stabilizer probably is designed to help um, take the ethanol out or control the the effects of ethanol, but but uh, try to find blends that do not use very much ethanol. And this is an example. Stable is the most common. They make a marine formulation, which is really just the same as the regular formulation. But there are other kinds too. Okay, so when we're talking about uh, gas and oil, we also need to talk about cooling an outboard motor. And this, again, is no different than your car engine. You need to cool the engine so it doesn't overheat. 
Um, we have the advantage with outboards is that we usually have a large body of water that, that can be used as a heat sink. So we don't have to have a radiator and coolant and a fan like you do in your car. You can just suck the lake water up, um, transfer heat to the lake water, and then shoot it right back into the lake. Uh, your, mo your outboard should have a telltale, which is a stream of water that shoots out the back of the engine very high up. And that ensures that water is circulating. Um, if there's no water coming out of the telltale, it's possible that you're still getting water circulating and cooling off the engine, but you don't want to take that chance. If you don't see water coming out there, you need to shut the engine off and figure out what's going on because you don't want to overheat the engine. You do not want to run the motor for any length of time out of the water. The water pump that's inside most of these motors has a rubber impeller. If that spins and there's no water, that rubber heats up very quickly and can shred very quickly, and then the water pump becomes very ineffective. So um, never run an outboard motor when it's out of water because you'll burn up the water pump. So this is a picture of the inlets. They're going to be very similar on most uh, outboards. And so this is where the water gets sucked in. If you are having trouble and you're not getting water at the telltale, the first thing to do is to check to see if these inlets get clogged up. We often work in shallow water or in water with a lot of vegetation. Uh, vegetation very commonly will clog up these inlets, especially if you're driving around slowly like you would with an electro fisher. So the first thing to do would be raise the motor, make sure these inlets are not clogged up. Also realize that if you run uh, in the mud and in shallow water, you're going to be kicking up mud and you're going to be sucking sand and mud and things into these inlets, which could clog them up, and that's not good for the motor. This is an example of the telltale. It's just going to be a stream of water shooting out the, the back, the top of the motor. If you have water at the telltale, you should have water everywhere else, and you should be properly cooling your outboard. Now, if you have to run the motor out of the lake, for example, if you're winterizing it or if you're trying to start it up to see if it'll run, what you can do is use these earmuffs. And you can see them down here covering the intakes. And these are just attached to a garden hose. And this allows you to provide water to the intakes so that you can run the motor. And when you start the motor up, you should get water coming out of the telltale at top. And, and this will allow you to run the motor and do any maintenance or tests or anything without having to go back it down into a lake. OK, um, the last uh, kind of lubrication thing we need to talk about is lower unit lubrication. So the lo lower unit is. Uh, homologous to the transmission of your car. It's the gears that take the, the spinning of the motor and translate it into the spinning of a prop. And so you've just got a couple of gears in there and you need special lubricant so that those gears um, stay properly lubricated. Now the lower unit is where the prop is located. So this of course is in the water whenever the boat's in the water. Consequently, it's possible for this lower unit lubrication to become contaminated with water. Um, if you have a screw loose or if you have a bad seal, you can get water in there. Once you get water mixed in with that lower unit oil, that reduces the lubricating effect of it, and it's not going to lubricate as well. That's a problem. Another problem is if you get water in that lower unit and then it gets cold and freezes, that water can expand and it can crack your lower unit. So we're always worried about water in the lower unit. Um, the lower unit oil is called, you know, it's gear lube. Uh, again, it's just a special kind of lubricant that goes into the lower unit. Here is the lower unit, uh, typical lower unit on an outboard. And you're always going to have two holes. You're going to have a lower hole or a drain hole and you're going to have an upper hole or a vent hole. And we always fill the lower unit by adding oil to the lower hole until we see that oil come out the upper hole. That ensures that no water or air is trapped inside the lower unit. Now, it's kind of a tricky thing to do. Um, 
And an easy way to do that is you get a special little pump like this, and you can see how this pump is on top of the bottle of oil. And so we can pump the oil until it comes out that top hole, and then we replace the screws, and that's how we fill the lower unit with oil. Now, checking the lower unit, um, it's not like checking the oil in your motor. There's not a dipstick or anything, and we don't have to check it as often as we do the motor oil. Usually what you do is just slightly unscrew the lower screw and see if any water comes out. Don't take the screw all the way out. Just screw it until, until liquid starts to leak out and make sure it's not water. If it's not water, if it's oil, great, because if it's water, the water should be at the bottom, right? The oil should rise on top of the water. So if water's coming out, you've got a problem. You need to drain the lower unit, replace the, the lower unit oil, and see why water's getting in there. But if there's no water coming out, quickly seal that screw back up, and you're good to go. Now, failure to closely monitor the oil, the cooling, and the lubrication will cause quick catastrophic motor failure. So it's essential that you take this seriously and you know what you're doing. Okay, there's other um, just uh, maintenance that I want to talk about just to, to bring them to your attention and we'll talk about these in more detail later. Uh, the first is grease zerks. A grease zerk is just a little nipple. I've got an arrow drawn to one here. And it's just a place where you put a grease gun on and you can add grease to lubricate moving parts. Usually there's only a couple of these. They're associated with steering or with the trim. Um, and you just need to find where these are and grease them occasionally. Uh, you also need to check your prop occasionally. And one of the big things you need to check is does fish, is fishing line wrapped around the prop. This is a common problem and it can become a real problem because this is what can damage the prop seal and allow water to get into your lower unit. And so if you see fishing line, of course you need to remove it. But even if you don't see fishing line, you periodically need to pull the prop off because often the fishing line gets underneath, like in this example. And if it gets underneath and the prop spins, that fishing line will abrade the seal that goes around the drive shaft. And if it abrades it enough, that will start allowing water to get in and allowing lower unit oil to leak out. That's when you could have a problem. Okay, so that had a lot to do with the outboards. Let's talk just a little bit about general maintenance on boats and trailers. We'll have a lot more to say about this later. For boats, a couple of big things. Make sure your battery is charged up and make sure your fire extinguishers are charged up. This is something you need to be checking on all the time. Again, because the boats often sit there for long periods of time unused, you might have a slight um, short somewhere, um, or but just sitting outside and the batteries are gonna slowly drain charge. The fire extinguishers, that might happen too. Um, so you need to be checking on these all the time and make sure that they're charged up um, fire extinguishers are discharged. They have to be refilled by someone qualified. Um, there's really no such thing as a, a half-charged fire extinguisher. If your battery um, seems to be discharged a little bit, just put a battery charger on it every once in a while. For the trailers, you need to keep checking the lights. Um, you don't want to go down the road unless you've got good trailer lights. It's just good safety practice. You want to Always make sure there's plenty of air in the tires and don't forget the spare. Um, again, if the boat is sitting there for a long time, you don't want it to be sitting on half-filled tires. That's hard on the tires. And if you're going down the road, you definitely want the tires to be full, uh, filled up to the proper pressure. And finally, you also want to make sure that there's grease in the trailer hubs. So if you look on the trailer hubs, you should see grease zerks there too. And so you're periodically going to add grease so that the trailer hubs um, are properly lubricated. Okay, so that's just an intro into general boat maintenance. I can't cover the specifics for every motor, every boat, every trailer, okay? They're all a little bit different. And so it's up to you to know your equipment. 
You have to be comfortable with this. And if you're not comfortable, you have to ask because you do not want to tear up the equipment just because um, you didn't put oil in a two-stroke engine, for example. So you must know what kind of equipment and what needs to be done for all your equipment. Um, how often should we be doing these things? We'll kind of talk about this in more detail, but really, every time you use the boat, you need to check the oil, you need to check the battery and the fire extinguishers, you need to check the trailer lights, you need to, um, when you're running the outboard, you need to constantly be watching to make sure water is coming out of the telltale. And you also, every time you use the boat, you have a lot of safety and legal issues, which we'll talk about later on. So there's lots of things you need to get in the habit of doing every single time. Um, every time you gas up, you need to add fuel stabilizer. And if you've got a two-stroke, you need to add, immediately add oil to the fuel or to the reservoir. Don't say, oh, I'll remember, I'll just add the oil later. You won't remember. You won't remember how much gas you put in. You need to get in the habit of doing that immediately. Uh, I'd say every month or so, check the air in the tires. Um, put grease in the trailer hubs. Again, if you this depends upon use. So if you're using it every single day, you're probably going to need to do this more often. But if you're not using it, um, definitely every month or so. Um, you know, air slowly leaks out of the tires. You just need to, to check that periodically. A couple times per year, you just want to check for water in the lower unit, pull the prop, check for fishing line, and grease the zerks on the trim and the steering. Uh, that, again, depends upon how much you're using the outboard. And finally, um, once per year, again, more often if it's heavy use, if you've got a four-stroke, you need to change the oil and change the filter. Um, and in fact, some of the motors are probably used often enough. This needs to be done a couple times per year, but definitely at least once per year. You definitely need to change the lower unit oil once per year. Um, changing the spark plugs every year is a good idea, um, especially if you've got heavy use. And then if you're going to store the boat over winter or for long periods, there are other kind of special maintenance things like fogging the carburetor and that, which we'll cover in a section later when we talk about storing the outboards. Okay, well, that's it. Um, that's the first intro into boat maintenance. And thanks a lot, and I will talk to you later.